then put in a couple things just straight from Logic, actually. The EVD6, which is, I don't know what that is. It's a bass. That's what it is. <laughs> but I don't, let's see what it sounds like. I'm pretty sure it doesn't sound exactly just like a bass. It's a plucked bass, but it's pretty high up. So let's take a look really quickly at the effects here, too. One thing I always do when I work in Logic is the first thing on every channel is put a, an EQ. And, you know, if you don't have processing power issues, Waves has great EQs and definitely would use that. I actually am so used to using the um, Logic ones that I usually just use the Logic EQ 8 on the channels themselves. And then on the final EQ, I'll use Waves. Um, but yeah, so you can see here that, you know, what I want to get out of this is a bass, but I wanted to bring up the higher frequencies. I always usually cut out the bottom, even of kick drums. So this is what it sounds like on its own. Actually, I can go, I can just play it. But I'm playing it more like around here or somewhere. So you can see where the frequencies are. They're like below 500. So then I put the delay on it. And this delay, delay designer, there's so many different things you can do here. But it's, if you can hear, again, I don't know what the sound is like out there. I hope it's all right. Um, it's like a little 16th note delay that's going on there. On top of that, I've got another delay, a stereo delay, which is really low in the mix. Just kind of giving it like a more shimmering. This is another thing that it's kind of, I'm using more and more is distortion. You might think that you, that distortion, why would I want to make anything sound distorted? But it's a cool way to add gain sometimes with a bit of color to it at the same time. Rather just than adding gain, it adds some texture at the same time. So I've been adding, trying, by ear to add distortion to, to let's say like a Rhodes or, or a Wurlitzer sound that might sound a little like cold and mm. not very warm before just adding a compressor or something. So I added, I added on this one too, you know, here we are with software synth, it's supposed to be a bass, add a little distortion. And then lastly, a little tremolo, which in Logic, <coughs> by the way, no matter what you're using, tremolo is a really good way just to get panning. Mm -hmm essentially, you know, I, I didn't really realize that. They don't have a panning. I, if you're using Ableton or whatever, it's pretty easy, again, to draw the panning <coughs> or, you know, there's certain plugins, I guess, that are automatic panning or random panning. But in Logic, there's actually not, as far as I know, a panning plugin. So if you use tremolo, like you can see here, the rate of it's three bars. So now when I'm playing this, it's gonna go from left to right, back and forth in three bars. So essentially, I guess all the stuff I did on that one was just to add some movement. Delay, panning via the tremolo, and then a little bit of a nicer sound with the uh, distortion. But if you need something for the groove, when he's asking about groove, um, let's just mute these, or sorry, solo these couple of things here at the top like we had earlier. Um, basically, is just like a two-bar loop. So this, I'm just going to go, so it's down to like kick and clap, basically. Right? Kick, clap. Then this thing is like on the and, right? So let's just add, you know, a pretty straight thing. This thing is going to be between the first kick and the first clap, right? Oops, if I solo it, hold on. And then I have one muted per bar. Mm -hmm. So it's not happening every time, but it's like like that. And then this part of the groove then, when you want to add something extra, Ultra Beat can be cool for that. So let's see what I've got going on here. Ultra Beat. And this, I took, at first I was just like, I don't know how to use this thing at all, but it's really not that hard. You just go on the left-hand side. It's a bit side. of a strange I interface, <laughs> but once you get through it, it's, it's a great little synth, yeah. Exactly, yeah, I, I would, I'd say that for sure. So maybe online, if you have tutorials or mm -hmm. somewhere online, yeah. it really only takes like 10 minutes, but it took me like a couple of years to actually open this thing and use it. And I was like, wow, why did I never use that? So this is just, sounds like, like you can see, on the left hand side, I think that this p particular thing, it's like, you know, all the different sounds in that kit. So I'm playing a mid tom right there. I don't know what I'm playing. Yeah, it says toms. So that's, 
basic tom. So what, what you can do then is just draw in right here where you need it in that groove. So I'm going to actually just make a two-bar loop so we can not lose this little image. So we had, I remember, something right here on the and. So it's like, boom, boom. Then we've got something else that was, I think this might be doubling something else. Then remember, that's muted on that second half of that bar. Mm -hmm. So let's see what it sounds like together. So this is, if you click on this thing up here, probably most people know that, turn that thing green on the right, then you can hear what you're clicking on midi-wise. So this is a little higher pitch, kind of conga, tom thing, low thing. So that's, so I would say when making, to answer that question about the groove and stuff, you know, drum machine, this, that, and the other, and then when you're getting to the last stage, I would recommend trying this ultra beat thing or another synth, mm -hmm. even that um, sub, -boom, sub boom bass thing that I had open earlier that has some drums in there, but kind of adding MIDI and just really like listening with your ears, basically like same story, like you love a track like the first day and you're like, I'm making this cool new track and like, like day, day two you're like, does this really suck? You know what I mean? Like, really, is this terrible? And like, then you just have to rethink the whole thing and the, the groove and everything. And then that's when maybe, when you're getting to that point, you start muting things and, and just try to listen to the groove and hi-hats and stuff too. I guess the other thing too is just to try to think about, John Tejada had given me that tip that somebody gave to him, which is that the one thing when you make a decision about a sound is that you know, maybe when you first start making music, you have this idea like, well, the mastering guy is going to like fix it. Mm. So, you know, you're like kick drum and this, that, and the other. You're like, well, it might sound like a little thin, but once it gets mastered, it's going to sound amazing. Well, like there's only a certain amount they can actually really do. So I would just say be really careful when choosing your drum sounds to just, let's just pretend that's just going to, how they're going to sound, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. don't, don't put in too much room for that aesthetically. So. I try to think about that a lot and you know so for example these claps I've done even like bought tracks as wave files quite a bit or encoded vinyl because I so want the sound of a clap or a snare you know like Radio Slave has amazing sounding mm. like claps and snares and again you'll spend so much time how do I do this mm. I'll just buy a record and just sample it sometimes because yeah, yeah, it's yeah. driving me insane because you have to get because you if you it's all about that frequency and that sound so like these claps actually I'm pretty sure I bought that track. It's called East Claps. I think this is Alexander East. I bought his tune because I was like, I really want that. That was without the EQ. I think it was like, and then I panned it. That's another thing you can do if you want your drums to sound like a little looser is like I have the claps, one pan to the left and one to the right and two kicks, like I said. So yeah, I guess like, you know, with the drums, it's just like choose good sounds layer them, pan them, and make things change every so often. I can't like go inside every single one of these things, but you can even just visually see like every eight bars or 16 bars, try to have like a feature mm. moment. Yeah, then I would say that would be like clap effects. I'll just quickly look at what that one is. That was on, again, ultra beat. So on ultra beat here, We'll just listen to this little bit starting at 81, but just put on, I decided at a certain point, I guess, to add a little bit more of a clap. It's just subtle, but. Mm. It keeps it moving, keeps it interesting, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah, just so it doesn't sound like, is the CD skipping? You're assured something <laughs> changed, you know, the CD is not skipping. It's like my feet don't even touch the ground. At Point Blank Online, you've got two methods of interaction with your tutor. Firstly, you've got the weekly online masterclass, which is in real time. And then also we've got feedback on your assignments, and that's known as DVR. So the online masterclass is a one hour session you get with your tutor every week. You can ask questions about the lesson content and get instant feedback and also demonstrations on the fly from their computer desktop with our streaming technology. 
DVR stands for Direct Video Response, and the concept is really simple. You upload your Ableton Logic or Cubase project file to your tutor, he downloads it, and then pushes record on the screen capturing software, and evaluates your work, so basically giving you one-to-one -one feedback. You see all of the mouse movements and any parameter changes made by your tutor. It's kind of like sitting in the studio over their shoulder watching what they're doing whilst they work. We have found the DVR process has truly revolutionized the way that we teach online and the results speak for themselves. Book your place on a course now by visiting pointblankonline.net.